Good evening and welcome to the Evening Review. My name is Ohana Klare. Let's take a look at the front page. Good evening and welcome to the Evening Review. My name is Ukhwane Klache and joining me in studio is Professor Mburumba Kerena who gave Namibia its name. Welcome, Prof. Thanks so much. Prof, what have you been up to in recent time? In recent time, I have been busy with my biographers to write my biography from day one when I was born right through, hopefully, to the end of my life. Ah. And when did you start working on the biography, Prof? Oh, it's been now two years. We've been traveling around the country and uh, the first thing that uh, I try to do is to find out with the help of my biography where my great-grandfather was buried. He was an Englishman by the name of Green uh, who came to our country to help the Hereros uh, against the Orlams and so forth when they were stealing their cattle. His name was uh, changed to the Herero when he got married to my great-grandmother, uh, Kaipukire, uh, of the first paramount chief of the Hereros, Kaichene. Whereas my great-grandmother was uh, a sister to that gentleman. And eventually, after he had died 140 years ago, nobody knew exactly where he was buried. And finally, we found his grave in the Namib Desert. With the help of uh, my biographer, you know, uh, Mani Goldbeck of Gondwana, mm -hmm. we were able to have the, his stone designed and when it was finished with his picture, we took it to his grave site and erected it there. Hopefully, I hope that uh, it will attract the Canadian tourists to come to this country because uh, it's a historic event and uh, he's known all over the world. Green who became Karina. Okay. Yes. And then, um, Prof, moving now on, um, in recent times there are a lot of talks around removing the Hentis by Gallows, removing the statue of Kurt van Francois. What do you make of all of these debates happening to remove these structures? That I think that's a tragedy mm. because they are part of our history. And I don't think, you know, we should go into this African fed, you know, that doesn't last to destroy our own history. Those people were here and we have to know what they have done and write about it ourselves from our own point of view, not from the perspectives of the white in this country and whatnot, who have become Namibians. Mm. The white community today, especially the German community, for instance, they are, they are the fifth generation in our country. Yet we make them feel as if they are, they are just yesterday's arrival. That's how short-sighted we are. And I think uh, to touch some of these issues, our government must be sensitive to go to the ethnic groups areas where this statue 
ex you know, have been erected and ask the history so our, ch our children can know the truth. Why these people came to this country and what they have done and so forth. Instead of just going around, I've been all over Africa and I've seen some of this uh, nonsense all over Africa. And eventually, of course, we ended up with Zimbabwe. Today, the Zimbabwean uh, government is trying to uh, solicit uh, assistance to have uh, some of these farmers who made uh, life easy for everybody in uh, Zimbabwe return. Are we going to find ourselves in the same position to go back to, say, Germany and, and where else, you know, to get some of these people who lived in this country and whose statues have been destroyed and so forth? Even their children would not know their history, as parents and so forth. And then now talks, um, then there's also been talks that, uh, wh what are you about in ancestral land? What would you say are your thoughts about ancestral land and this debate that the land should be returned to, to, to the original inhabitants of the Government land? must sit and deal with this issue realistically and practically. They must not just uh, rubbish, you know, throw it under the carpet and finish about it. Hmm. What is wrong about talking uh, about ancestral land. Let the issue come up in public so that people can talk about them rather than use the law and the government power to just shove this aside. Let's talk about its issues. It's the same things like the Lubangos and so forth. Let these issues come out so that our people, our nation can at least be free from those uh, problems. Mm. The young generation have nothing to do, you know, the bone freeze. They want to know the truth. We send them to school. They learn how to use even your uh, new technologies and so forth. There's nothing you can hide. But let our government give that confidence that we are confident in what we are doing. Let's have the president call a meeting with the victims of Lubango to tell the truth so that at least, you know, the future generation cannot be haunted by this issue that is unresolved up till today. Why be afraid of these issues? These things have happened. Why not handle them? We have dealt with the situation uh, when the apartheid government was here openly and we were united, it didn't divide us. Even though the apartheid government tried to divide us, we didn't allow it. And today we are afraid of, even because some of our people were involved. Some of our people were involved in Lubango, the most tragic part of our history and revolution the armed struggle that was started by Namibians, disgraced with issues that had nothing to do with the struggle, lost many, many potential people, very important people. Why don't we deal with these issues? I would like to appeal to our president that he has set a good example of meeting with the uh, Lubango representatives, you know, and especially the victims, young people who were enticed to go outside our country under Swapo in order to be sent to schools and whatnot, only to be forced to end up in refugee, refugee camps and also in, uh, in, in, the, in, in, the, in the planned battalions and whatnot without their concern. Some of them were forced into that. We must deal with all this. And what happened? We have uh, Ms. Dempas, for instance, who has tried very much to sensitize our people and our government. And I think only President uh, Hage Gangop was able to meet with, with them, for which he was uh, very happy about having him listen to this. And I support him. If he needs my presence one day to even de deal with this issue of uh, Lubango, I'll be very happy to. And I'm sure that there are other, other leaders in Swapo who will also be very happy to resolve this question. One of them that I have respect for is our religious leader, uh, uh, Minister Kameta, for instance. Mm. Yes. It's people like that who, who are sensitive and who can be able to instill reason in issues so sensitive like that. Let the president have uh, trust and confidence in some of us where we, there, we are there with him to deal with some of these issues. All of a sudden, in the presidency of uh, Age Gaingov, and I've known uh, Hage, my son, uh, from 1963 when we met in, in, in Botswana, for instance, at uh, Philip Matandes, you know, opposition leader of the opposition party. 
from that time on, I've known him and followed him. And I know quite a lot about him. And I think he's capable of moving this situation of, of, of all our problems that we are facing, for instance. Not only this COVID-19 you know, and whatnot, that some of the people are using for their own ends. A lot of problems have come up in the, in the presidency of uh, President uh, Hage Gango. Mm. Why? Why? Because he's not of one tribe or the other. He's a Namibian. There is no ethnic group in this country that has not fought against foreign occupiers or anyone who was trying to become occupiers of, of our country. All of us and all our people and ethnic groups have been involved in this struggle rather than a struggle ending up with one ethnic group. We cannot allow that. We are all Namibians. Would you then say that in that sense that the history, the, the history of, of liberation has been distorted to some extent? Completely for some people's interest. And it has made them very rich for the time being. I think every Namibian deserves to be, you know, to aim for the presidency if they can afford to or can be able to. And I think uh, even uh, Honorable, uh, uh, we we'll call him KK Kadenambo, mm. he is the one who made it possible for Hage to become president when he said that pres the presidency is not owned by one ethnic group. Anyone from any of our, uh, you know, of our ethnic groups can aspire to become president of this country. We are only two million people. We don't even constitute a good, solid market. We don't even produce manufacturing goods that are of substance to be sold overseas and so forth. All that we produce is what God has provided us with, and that is fish. And we are unable to even complement the efforts of God in helping us to have such a wonderful ocean. He has given us cattle. We are unable to even put together a slaughtering facilities for export. We have so many things that we are supposed to do in this country. Our country is a reserve, a natural reserve bank, blessed by God for two million people in a country so big to dwarf our own thirst and, and hunger, to tell you the truth. Every Namibian must become a wealthy person. But look what has happened. We have fish rods, youngsters stealing money of, that can afford to tell, send our children to schools, money that can afford to build proper houses for our people and whatnot, instead mm. of living in, in these teens and whatnot. There is something that, if you have been in the struggle, my son, not born today, you, you, you'll regret that we have come to end up the way we have ended up. Namibians have seen a lot, those of us who were in exile, things that we could have brought back home. We have forgotten about that. We are busy stealing the wealth of our country. You steal 100 million. How many lives do you want to live to come and finish that 100 million? You can't even deal with 1 million. But you can take 100 million under your name and you have, you probably are just about 35 years old. What about the others? Can they afford to eat? They want to eat. But they don't want to steal. They want to work for whatever they earn. You go, for instance, to the tin houses there and talk to people, you'll be ashamed to look in the tin houses where in which they sleep and to look at some of our own ministers, you know, driving Mercedes-Benz that we make the company in Germany rich. We change Mercedes-Benz every day, almost every year. Every time we have a new president, we must have new Mercedes-Benz. And the Germans are laughing at that. Why don't we sit down and plan? Now we are confronted, you know, with uh, COVID-19. Mm -hmm. We can't even help the president to come up with ideas to help him in this effort of his for the for the recovery of the of, of the country from this from our economy. Mm. 
We are still, you know, depending on Hage has to bring everything. Yet if Hage and when Hage is trying, we criticize Hage. Because he's not of one ethnic group or the other. Forget it. I'm not of that type of person. That's why I named this country Namibia for all of us. Not just for one group. And that's when we started even with Swapo. I'm the one who was asked to name you know, to find an organization that we can name. And when I was confronted with that issue, I said, uh, the first thing we must do is to get rid of the contract system that took our children, mm. our youth from here to South African mines. Many of them died under the grounds there. We will never know where they are buried. And I said that Okaholo, Vumberland People's Organization, for the, to free the Okaholo young people from that slavery. And we did it when pe other people were saying that we will never be able to succeed because South African government is very powerful. And then later came the changes again. We were asked, is it possible to come up with a name that can take over the whole of the ethnic groups in the North? Mm -hmm. I said, it's possible. Nothing is impossible if you can think about it and devote ourselves honestly to the, to the changes that we want. And I came up there with the name OPPO, Southwest Africa People's Organization. And as we progressed, people were laughing at us. South Africans used to simply ignore us because we didn't have good education and so forth. They were the forerunners of good education in South Africa. Private schools, universities, whatnot. We didn't have anything. We were running from South, Southwest Africa to South Africa to go to school, high schools and whatnot. And eventually I said, let's uh, name the organization Southwest Africa People's Organization for all our people in order to prevent the apartheid government from dividing us. And that's how the movement was moved from the north to the central. And it grew. We we're very proud of it. We were all together. And then when exile came, we ended up with uh, internal exile, I mean internal swapo and external swapo. And the mess came from the external swapo at the end of the day. Prof, coming back now to the issues of governance and have you having mentioned that uh, it's perhaps uh, the most difficult presidency that um, Namibia has gone through, particularly with the challenges that uh, President Hake Kengkwap has had since coming into office. How would you rate or what would you make of the affairs or the state of government in Namibia? So far, I think we have tried to... The UN created a mess. They left us with a mess that we are dealing with now, to tell you the truth. They didn't have time, they were in a rush. We ourselves were under pressure because of the arm struggle mm -hmm. and what we were what our people were facing so i think somewhere there some of us felt uh let's let's go through with uh, independence you know mm. as if it was going to be a quick fix and the independence that we rush into with the help of uh, the temporary time of the un when it was here without going into the whole issues of what uh, the country can do after independence and so forth. We weren't given time to really think about all those things. We were just busy trying to think about how to end this war because it was taking a toll on our people, it was taking a toll on our youth, and it was just becoming too difficult for us to cope with. Mm. And eventually, when the five Western powers were set up at the United Nations, we thought that that is probably the way out of this uh, predicament of our struggle. Mm. We wanted to have independence and then to become free so that we can blame ourselves for our own mistakes and not take our mistakes to other countries' doorsteps. Mm. And we, this is what we tried to do in the first uh, years of our independence. We had a good leadership that tried very, very hard to keep the country together and somehow the world economy started changing and affecting us.
country of 2 million people. South Africa was using us as a dumping ground for its product. Didn't even put up factories, major factories to produce anything. Everything came from South Africa, South Africa and whatnot. But now we are left alone in a hostile world, vulnerable, trying to figure out how to survive and help our people in the country to survive. And I can tell you, my son, if only Hage can surround himself with all the brains that started this struggle and then bring in the youth, we can go, we can go someplace. But if Hage is making jokes with young people and he thinks he can solve problems with young people, they are still growing. They are not going to help him. At the end of the day, they'll, ask, they'll come to him and ask for a lollipops. Stock leggers. Mm. Huh? Prof, the, the, then now, going back, in the, in the, if we have to go back 30 years, what do you think Namibia could have done differently to elevate itself or herself? First of all, we should have looked into our economy to take an overview, to overhaul the whole economy, and then to identify our resources that can back up our, you know, what we are trying to build. I came up with the idea, for instance, with, Chief, uh, with the late Chief Riwako mm -hmm. of genocide. To have the Germans, you know, discussions with the Germans so that they can look together with us into the genocide of Van Trotta here in the Namibia. Today, the genocide, after we took the German government and their companies that participated in that war, of extermination of one or two of our ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. you know, today the issue has become a football for everybody who wants to make himself famous. I have stood out of these bickerings mm. for a reason. I didn't, have, I didn't want my credibility to be dented by anybody and by stupidity. I don't like stupid people, my son. I like intelligent people because for what is in this small head, I've worked for it. Mm. And I would like to see young people in this country working on this computer so that they can stand on their own and contribute to the welfare of all our people in this country. I don't like to be a beggar. Uh -uh. With the resources our country has, forget about uh, even wishing to be a beggar or going to ask somebody for something. And I believe that we can make it. I wrote an article just a few days ago in which I proposed to uh, President Hagi Gangob that first of all, we cannot find a quick fix after this corona business. What he must do is gather some brains together. Mm. Some of us will be very happy to participate, to help him, you know, to, over, to take an overview and overall of our economy. And then secondly, to come out with the strategies of how to plan the recovery, and then to identify those strategies of issues and resources that will complement and support such a transformation. This transformation is not going to be easy, to tell you the truth, my son. Mm. Yes, I've seen it in other countries where, where I've lived, and I think ours uh, for our economy in which it is now, uh, that's why some of our people are trying to, you know, sell uh, EPLs to the Chinese and mm. whatnot. Chinese have a design, uh, you know, an agenda for their own survival. When they are coming here, they have come to see stupid people who can be bribed very easily, you know, and selling their, their lives. China today is looking for territories where they can even produce food for their own people in China. Why shouldn't we sit down and confine the Chinese people to their village to just sell what they manufacture in China here and not be able to be allowed to buy land, to buy farms and things like that. This, you know, the land in this country, mm. Namibians fought for it with the first white men who arrived here. That's when the war started over the land issue, all the way up to the independence struggle.
Why should we actually allow some other people who have fought for their own independence in their own countries and freedom to come and then now grab our countries? Go to on Machete, for instance. They have threatened a mountain looking for granites and whatnot. We can't afford that. The Chinese are a very powerful country. They can look after themselves in China. And here they can, we can be friends and continue to work with them. We, they have a space now called Chinatown here. Let them be confined to Chinatown and sell their products and so forth. Just like they are confined to their Chinatowns in America, in New York, they, there's a big one in Los Angeles, there's another one. Yeah. All over Asia, they, you know, the Chinese have their properties and so forth in their own Chinatown and so forth. Mm. But Prof, I want to touch then again on the genocide talks. Um, there are talks, there are there, there, there thoughts that the affected party should be leading these discussions with the Germans. And now you have government coming in. What, in your view, should be happening as far as the genocide talks are concerned? I said one day when that question was raised in a t TV discussion or interview, the Germans did not kill Namibians. The Germans killed Hereros and Namas, almost obliterated them. The first parties that have the right of refusal or the right of agreement to discuss genocide are the Namas and the Hereros. Our government that was just formed yesterday and to, for which I have the honor of even having named our country Namibians, mm -hmm. it just came yesterday. It should be a signatory to confirm, just to confirm the agreement that has been reached between the Hereros and the Namas with the Germans. Chief Rirocco and myself, we took the German government and German companies to court in Washington under a legislation that I've studied very thoroughly, for which I've you know, I, 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 I based our case when I asked uh, Chief Rirwako to join me because of the chair that he was sitting on mm. of Chief Jose Akutago, who sent me to the United Nations. And when we were at the, in the case, uh, at the court in Washington, an issue came up apparently during the course of the litigations and so forth of the blue book the blue book was destroyed completely there was even a copy in our library here that disappeared nobody knows who actually snatched it or stole it mm. but i knew when we took south africa to the international court of justice with reverend michael scott with liberia and ethiopia reverend michael scott took me to the archive of the International Court of Justice and showed me the book, the blue book, and said, my son, please don't come up and pulling this book out now while we are fighting the South Africans. It's going to confuse the issues at stake in the court here. Let's first finish with South Africa. And then if, if we are still alive, you know, you or me or both of us, then uh, our country is independent, then we can bring this issue of German genocide in Namibia and so forth. That was, uh, that obliterated literally the Hero people and the Nama people and mm. so forth. So I gave him a promise. When our country became independent, I realized that during the early part of, the, of our independence, I couldn't bring up this issue of genocide because the chemistry was not ready for it yet. And eventually, as we got ourselves involved into the whole independence, you know, celebrations and whatnot, and our government uh, being put together properly and so on, we eventually decided that, uh, let me just mention to Chief Kwaimari uh, Woko, that uh, we must take the Germans to court, and we did so under the alien towards uh, legislations that was used by a South American country. And eventually, we ended up, I knew the lawyers where we could uh, actually seek assistance and so forth. We approached them and they agreed, we went ahead and so forth. The second part of this issue that was taken to New York court, 
it was a joke because I lived in New York mm -hmm. and I know the setup of New York. And I said uh, to some of our colleagues that uh, it's not going to work. We've already touched the issue in Washington and we know where we ended in Washington, even with the Germans. If President Hage Gangop can just sit down and review that whole issue and do whatever since and do whatever he did like at the, at the Bank of Namibia by taking somebody outside rather than taking from inside of those who have been associated with the creation of a Bank of Namibia mm -hmm. with us. If he asked me today, here is the issue of genocide. Now I'll give it to you. You started it with the late uh, Chief Kwame Riwako. Take it, provided you work with the government. And of course, I'm going to work with the government mm -hmm. because I'm part of the creation of our government. I cannot work outside our government. It won't take me a year because I know where we ended in court in Washington. Mm. Yes, sir. Mm. And then, Prof, in closing, uh, what is your aspirations and hopes for Namibia? Namibia is a great country. But Namibia does not need quick fixes. Namibia needs men and women who have already proven themselves. Some of them carried guns in exile, in a plant for, you know, battalions and so forth. They are very strong. We are very strong people. And that is what has made the difference between us and the South African brothers and sisters. And I'll tell you what, the ANC was fighting apartheid, not fighting to become a new nation. Mm. Namibia was fighting to become a new nation, to get away from South Africa altogether and become our own selves in this part of the continent. Mm. That's why when I met President Sukarno in Indonesia when we were fighting, President Sukarno said, where do you come from? I said, Mr. President, where do you think I come from or where you got me from? He said, no, I want to know from you. I said, I come from Southwest Africa. He said, no, 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 my son. There is no such thing as Southwest Africa. Angola is also geographically in that part of the world. One day when uh, both your countries are independent and you are not working together, Angola is also going to claim that part of uh, Southwest Africa. And I said, it is true. He said, well, you are fighting to become a nation. And I said, yes. Well, let me tell you, my son, slaves and dogs are named by their masters. Free men name themselves, name yourself. We'll be prepared to write it in our magazines, diplomatic magazines and whatnot, and spread it around the world. And that's when I started going around. And I remember I had a, a friend in a Swapo, a young man like yourself, mm -hmm. uh, Jacob Kuhangwa, very cantabrous little fellow <laughs> and uh, he was blustering me every day when he came to petition with the rest of the group he'll say brumba the name what name the names we're just not dogs and slaves we want a name and i start writing about this fictitious fictitious country called the Namib nation. When we are independent, we are going to call ourselves Namib, the Namib independent nation. And then our, our nationalism, we are going to refer to it as Namibianism. And finally, when this name went around, of course, the UN snatched the one that says Namibianism, Namibia, because of Ethiopia, Tanzania, Zambia, and so forth. Mm. That's how I baptize you Namibians. All of you in this country running around, if somebody looks for a brand on you, they'll find a brand on your behind called Namibia. It was Brumba Kerina's brand. Brumba Kerina's brand, who was a co-founder together with his colleagues, Herman Jatoivo, Sam Nuyoma, and others.
many of whom never even saw the free Namibia only after they've gone to the spirit world and left us with this beautiful reserve bank of God that is refusing to be born. We must be born, my son. You must be Namibians. Don't be Damras, Hereros, whatnot, Vambos and whatnot. Mm. Be Namibians. Do not stop launching your cultural revolution as you have started with uh, uh, our young men in parliament, Swadbor and others who support just the struggle, not Vedbo as a person, Swadbo as a youth. He followed in the footsteps of Itula, he followed in the footsteps of others as well. Mm. Do not stop. Do not have the old dead wood, you know, use government titles in order to silence you. Stand up like all the youth in other countries have stood up against evil things, against bad things. It is your future that you have to define now. We defined our future yesterday when we said freedom now in our lifetime, no more, no less. You must also define yourself. You have your freedom now. Define yourself what you want to be like in future because we are not going to live there with you in your future. You are going to be faced by that future which is technically and technologically very different mm. from our future, the time that we define it. Thank you very much for joining us, Prof. Thanks very much for talking to me and I'm glad to talk to you. Thank you. Stay tuned for our weather. Good night.